a little bit about me. Oh, by the way, my name is Jeff, and I go by program on the internet. So I'm from Austin, as mentioned. It's actually uh, quite a beautiful city. Um, and uh, it's also a weird city. It's actually, <laughs> there's a, a, a motto, keep Austin weird. It's weird on a number of levels. And according to this uh, fancy infographic, I've only been living there for about a year. Before that, I lived in this city, but do any of you recognize it? San Francisco. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not the usual skyline, but I, I chose this picture because I, uh, I used to live there. Not in that building, but in a tiny building behind it. <laughs> so I'm known for a lot of my open source work. Uh, local tunnel, Doku, and I sort of work as a free agent, but I've worked with a lot of companies, as mentioned. Uh, I worked with DocCloud on the prototype of Docker when it was written in Python, and I worked at uh, NASA in the proto OpenStack days. I usually work on things in the early stages, and I was an early employee at Twilio, and now I work with DigitalOcean. So I'm here to talk about Flynn, a project that uh, I co-created, co architected, whatever. Uh, it actually has a developer release right now, so you can try it out at, at flynn.io. But I have a lot of stuff to cover. It's a really ambitious project. So this talk's going to be kind of high level. I usually try and do demos, but I, I can't really fit them in here. So, And the, and the thing about Flynn is it's, it's sort of a worldview. It's, it's an idealized platform, and it, it's actually kind of a new way of thinking about infrastructure. So, uh, so I kind of want to talk more about that. And in describing Flynn, you know, there's a number of ways that it could be described, maybe an open source platform as a service, like an open source Heroku. Uh, though it's a little bit more than that. Like the, that's not where the value is. Maybe a toolkit for building modern systems. But that's not really, that doesn't really tell you what it is. Um, or it could get pretentious and call it a postmodern meta platform. I've been calling it a meta stack, and maybe that'll make sense throughout this talk. But um, how many of you read this book in 2006? Oh, well, good. Yeah, it's a pretty good book. It's written by a buddy of mine, Cal Henderson, uh, about Flickr in 2006, and it kind of was the precursor to the whole DevOps movement. And the book actually covers more than just you know how to build scalable websites using open source software, but it talks about the whole sort of uh, the whole kind of pipeline, the delivery pipeline, version control, all that stuff. This is a very kind of DevOpsy book, and it's probably still relevant now. And I kind of think of Flynn, um, well, if, if we were to rewrite this book three years from now, it would be describing Flynn. So to get, I guess, specific, Flynn is something that lets you run on a bunch of hosts that uh, run Docker, and you run Flynn. And it will bootstrap a bunch of other containers that turns that, those hosts into a container compute grid, sort of like a Mesos or something like that. And then we give you a bunch of components which you can use um, to build your own system platform. So to help frame this problem, I want to tell a little story or show an example of if you were to build a photo sharing app like Flickr or something like that. Comparing um, the traditional way versus if you were to do this with a platform as a service like Heroku or something, just to kind of compare these two approaches, most of you probably are familiar with the traditional approach. I mean, that's what most of the talks are about. Most software today is geared towards this traditional approach. It's a classical approach. How many of you have um, deployed uh, websites on Heroku or used Heroku? OK. So yeah, and, and so you, you, you understand that there are limitations to it as well. And so that's kind of going to talk about that. Um, so there, there's a real divide between these two worldviews, right? If you're working on a Heroku app and you run into limitations and you can't use that anymore or hosted, app, hosted infrastructure and you want to go to host-based stuff, either EC2 or your own bare metal, you kind of have to reinvent everything. Or usually you don't. You usually have to redo everything using Chef or more traditional ways. Um, so let's look at a simple PHP app. And we're running it, we'll say, uh, so this is one host. And we put on EC2, we need more hosts. 
And slowly the application evolves and we get some specialized clusters and hosts <laughs> and we scale things a little bit and we add new things. Um, we even split the app up. We go, it's too monolithic. Let's do service-oriented architecture. Uh, of course, it was already service-oriented architecture because you had all these backing services. Only the ops people know that, though. But you, so this looks like a lot of applications that we, we run, although what's missing from this? Actually, all the support systems, you know, your build system, uh, you know, whatever you're using for, for source control, probably internal apps, um, you need all of these to run whatever it is you're running, uh, your, your website, your web application. And these all together make a fairly complex distributed system. And, and most web developers have to come to realize at some point that, like it or not, you're building a distributed system. And that's hard. And usually it's the ops people's responsibility to make that work. But DevOps is all about, and it's two ways. It's not just ops people writing version source code. You know, software engineers, app developers need to think more like ops people and think about the system as a whole. <coughs> so let's compare this with Heroku. If you build an app with Heroku, your app runs on Heroku and you use a bunch of hosted, usually a bunch of hosted uh, third-party add-on or uh, you know, backing services. And these are all equivalents of what we just had. But, and there's a lot of advantages to this. You know, it's like self-serve. You don't really need as many ops people. All the developers can just kind of set this up, self-serve wire together. It's process-oriented. You're not managing hosts. And it's easy. You've got easy deployment and, and workflow around it, like that whole no ops thing. But of course, there aren't a lot of huge websites that, do, that use this. Why not? Well, there's, there's a bunch of reasons. One, it's super expensive. And you're using all these different hosted services. Um, and then you have no control over them. And you're sort of limited to the lowest common uh, SLA. And the limited functionality you get, you know, if it doesn't work on Heroku, well, or, you know, you can't customize Postgres or whatever, right? So there's a lot of drawbacks to doing this. But there's definitely a lot of benefits. Uh, at Twilio, this is my sort of like made up diagram of Twilio's architecture. So they run 200 different services. Um, and that's a lot of services. I mean, you're running, and they're all running on EC2, so each host is a different service. And then you need, of course, two for redundancy. So, and this is when I left. So, you know, like 400 services at least, 400 hosts. Um, it was a pain to manage, right? Any of these systems at scale is a pain to manage. And there's a lot of tooling and stuff. Actually, Twilio built their own stuff because you didn't have a lot of the uh, e cool EC2 automations. And I think they're slowly moving towards uh, more you know, chef traditional configuration management stuff. But what we kept saying was we wish we could just have like Heroku. Or we could just run on Heroku. Uh, and actually, my friend Blake he's from Heroku, he's like, well, why don't you just run on Heroku? And I'm like, well, we, we literally can't. Um, you know, we, we, we have custom versions of things. We do protocols other than HTTP. Like, <laughs> You just can't do that on Heroku. But we wanted one, so we started thinking, well, ideally, in the ideal world, what would we want? We started with, well, it kind of looked like Heroku. And then we kind of went into the specifics. And this is where sort of the early ideas of Flynn's architecture came from, from my side. So getting back to this divide, Flynn is trying to bridge the gap between these two worlds uh, with layers of components that lets you build your own pass-like experience. And I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I, I don't always want to use the word pass because it makes people think of, you know, specifically Heroku or App Engine, when really it's like, it's pass-like. You have that same level of automation, that same potential user experience, developer experience. So, I mean, one way you could describe Flynn is it's a distribution of components. We're out of the box. It's, you know, like Linux, it's a distribution of components providing a starting point for an internal platform. We focus on internal platform. This is not like a cloud foundry or something where it's like, you're going to be building a platform as a service to then resell. This is for you to build your system on. But another way to think of it, maybe a more valuable way to think of it, is a collection of independent projects with a common worldview. That's the important part. that make up a, a toolkit for building distributed systems. Flynn is at the center of three worlds. Um, these all have different perspectives of how the world should be. 
distributed systems, you have things like high availability, fault tolerance, and uh, you know, talking about lock servers. Uh, in the web world, and I don't mean like in the browser, but you know, web developers think a lot about HTTP APIs, being able to have uh, RESTful APIs for everything. And then in the Unix world, the Unix, you know, they have their own philosophy. A lot of really good ideas that are generally applicable. And we've kind of borrowed a lot of them for Flynn. Um, these are our top Unix, you know, ESRs, Unix rules. We've got our top six. But kind of our design philosophy boils down to simple, composable, extensible components that are independently useful. You know, it's like cat and said, you know, those aren't part of some monolithic thing. So from this, we kind of get two really important traits. One is hackability. So it's not some solution that just solves, magically solves all your problems, uh, and you don't really know how it works. Uh, instead, it's, it's something that you actually, here's a bunch of Lego pieces that you can kind of put together. And as you put it together, you kind of actually learn more about the, the problems in this domain of distributed systems. Um, as well as being able to you know, customize and swap pieces out and stuff like that. But also one audience, and this comes back to the whole DevOps ideal, right? Instead of, so we don't, we don't differentiate between uh, Flynn developers versus developers using Flynn systems or operators of Flynn systems. Everybody should just have the same knowledge. It should all be really simple and easy to understand. So these are kind of driving forces. So the actual architectural principles and these sort of make up the Flynn worldview. The first thing is abstract the host. We don't want to manage hosts. We don't want to manage configuration on a host. We, what we want are processes. That's where the computation happens that we want. So hosts should just be like appliances that run and manage processes. And the, all the abstractions should be based around that. And so that's sort of you know, one ideal that we think about. Uh, another one is everything is ultimately a process, but that should be the basic building block. In this case, a containerized building block. So our whole system is based on Docker. Everything runs in Docker. So it doesn't matter what your host system is. And unlike a lot of platform services, you talk about your apps versus backing services. There is no difference. They're all services. They're all just long-running processes. So it's basically everything in, in, in Flynn, everything is a uh, containerized process. And it basically, containerized processes all the way down. So everything has an API. That's the other part. So every component has some way to programmatically interact with it an API hooks, scriptable, extensible. It's basically software as a service all the way down. Um, I don't want to be managing, well that brings us to, the, to kind of the next point, is we want to go from static configuration and managing static configuration files that you're going to be changing all the time and reloading processes anyway, to just runtime configuration. And embracing that kind of paradigm where everything has an API and config configuration can be changed on the fly. And your primary means of Changing it is via an API. But so we built in real-time adaptability. This is our sort of a generalization of fault tolerance, automatic failover, real-time scaling, fast deploys, you know, event-driven architecture, that sort of stuff. So having the primitives for that built in. And our, this is where the meta stack comes in. We're not Erlang. We're not Akka. Akka? I'm not a Java person. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, what tooling or stack you want to use. This is really uh, a framework for the, the infrastructure of how those things kind of fit together and how you run them on your, on your hardware. So inspiration pulled from a lot of places, obviously Heroku. It's basically a managed process platform. And they defer everything to third parties. It's basically a, their dyno manifold and routing. It's like the core of Heroku, which is cool. But even the routing gets in the way, right? I want to do WebSockets, and they don't serve WebSockets. Well, now they do, but they didn't back then. So it's like, well, I can't use Heroku now. So that's the idea, is if you, if you own it, and it's all just components that you can swap out, you can write your own router, or use HAProxy, or whatever you want. Um, Mesos, probably heard of Mesos by now. So came out of UC Berkeley, adopted by Twitter, by basically ex-Google employees that missed uh, Google's magic system called Borg. Um, and Borg is slowly being replaced by Omega, which is kind of what our system is more inspired by. So it's, and, th and this is basically a distributed computation scheduling framework. Uh, it's a generalized system for 
matching computation work processes to resources, hosts that have storage, memory, CPU. And so this is at the at core idea of Flynn, because this helps us abstract the host, right? Um, the cool thing about, I think, um, Brad Fitzpatrick was here last year. And he's like, if I were to do a startup, I would want something like this. Well, here it is. I mean, it's not done yet, but. Uh, so the actual Flynn architecture, we split it into two layers, and we call it layer zero and layer one. Uh, layer zero is more like the kernel. Layer one's like user space. Uh, layer zero is basically our container compute grid and a bunch of other stuff, distributed coordination, service discovery, inter-service communication. And then layer one is everything else. But layer zero, uh, big piece of this puzzle is Docker. So everything runs in Docker or Docker containers. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be Docker. It could be, you know, whatever the next, you know, magic container thing. Docker's the only one that actually understands what high-level containers are. Um, and so this is sort of the core primitive for Flynn. And why I was sort of excited about working with uh, Doc Cloud on, on Flynn in the early days. So we're using Docker to manage all your containers and all the hosts. Um, and then we need some sort of distributed coordination. Right now we're using etcd. Um, and you know, we chose this over Zookeeper because, I mean, honestly, who wants to use Zookeeper? Um, I mean, uh, what you want is the functionality it provides. And there's, it's good that there's now these, you know, alternatives to it. Um, etcd just happened to be also written in Go and, you know, kind of followed our same design principles. And now we're looking, I'm sort of playing with console, which is the same thing, raft-based configuration and coordination, also written in Go. Um, but, so this shared state is sort of usually an anti-pattern of distributed systems, you know, shared nothing architectures. But uh, it's sort of needed for bootstrapping that architecture. And service discovery, um, we built this thing, It'll probably be replaced by console. Um, duplex, we sort of re-envisioned RPC stuff, uh, and it's all tied together in this one project called Flynn Host, which is gonna just run on your hosts, and you get Compute grid, and of course, uh, this is a project that'll be out soon. It's kind of a competitor to like Mesos and Marathon, um, that is sort of a productized version of Layer Zero Flynn. And then you have all this other stuff that lets you basically throw together something like a Heroku. Um, and this is just kind of an example to show you what it would be, sort of self-assembling pieces. But anyway, the idea is that you can build a system as complicated as as this, as custom as this. But, uh, and ideally a, Twilio, a system like Twilio, and still retain all those properties of uh, Heroku or a platform-like service. Um, and hopefully, you know, bridge the gap between host-based infrastructure and pass. Ideally, you know, getting the best of both worlds and making both of them obsolete. So it's something new. So that's it. 